So let's get rolling today. We've got um, Peeper on the docket, always a delight. And this is your second go around with him. So what'd you think about today's Peeper Chunk? It seemed like a review. And then expounding upon those points, but yeah. Yeah, okay, good. There was some definite overlap and that's probably right. And that is not a bad thing, okay? So there's some review here, good. Other thoughts? Yes. I was trying to decide as I was reading it whether he was guilty of Flaker's sin. Yes. Speaking universally. Right. And I noticed in some areas he'd say this analogy differs by degree and sometimes manner, mm -hmm. which I took to at least I understood as basically him trying to specify exactly that relationship. Yeah. Which places him more in the modernist. Ag agreed. There are definite tendencies to that, and he has those times when he does that. And even the idea of talking about the attributes of God is just prone to that like crazy. And you should recognize that now, that you know, even the, this, this methodology of let's talk about God's attributes. Okay, <laughs> be really careful. Um, but Plinker does, I mean, um, or Peeper does have several times when he actually advocates or says things which sound very Plinkerian, if you will, okay? And so we can note those as well. Okay, good. Any other thoughts? Just getting started here. Yeah. I was just Adam. glad he laid out at the beginning the bit about making the distinguish, distinguishing between university and, you know, and Yeah, and yeah, that was very interesting. You, this is on page 431 where he's actually saying stuff that sounds like, wow, this is straight out of Plaker. He talks about unit language can be used univocally or equivocally or analogically. When it comes to talking about God, we're doing it analogically. Peeper says this. Now, what was the most noticeable thing about that page, noticeable for its absence? Let's see if anybody picked up on this. Who gives us that use of language? Oh, yeah. oh Aquinas. Aquinas. Mm -hmm. What's not on this page? <laughs> yeah, there's no reference to Aquinas anywhere on the page. And it's sort of like, you know, Peeper knows where it comes from. He knows it's from the Summa, but um, it's just like he can't quite bring himself to footnote the Summa in his book. You know, and I, and I really think that's what it's going on here. It's like, no, I'm not going to let Thomas come in. No. And he just has his limits. So he, he will talk about it. He, he's taking it straight out of the Summa, but he, he doesn't mention that it came from the Summa. Maybe he got it from somewhere else, but anyway, I, I'm suspicious it was more just, no, let's not bring Aquinas into it, even though that's what's going on there. All right, so that's, that's nicely done. So that's what I'm saying. You see some things that are, are very much like what Plaker would do. Um, Nathan, did you have your hand up? Um, I was just going to ask about the whole idolatry thing um, on page 330. Okay. That was something I was intrigued by, that anyone who denies the vicarious atonement, yes. the, the character of God, and it seemed that he also lumped in with those idolaters, just Catholicism as a whole. Yeah, yeah. Substitutes, you know, our marriage. So is he saying that anyone does not have what we would consider to be the right understanding of this patient is worshiping an idol. I think that's exactly what he's getting at here, yes. And see, now this again, this creates this issue. You're, you're going to encounter this again and again throughout your theological studies and systematics of, okay, what about all these heterodox teachings? Are these Christian and they're just, you know, part of us, but they're kind of a little bit off? Or are they worshiping a false god? Are they idolaters? Are they extra, extra ecclesium? You remember that term, right? Are they out, actually outside the church? And sometimes people seems to be saying, they're not even Christian. Okay? Then other times it's like, well, of course, you know, they're brothers in the faith. And it kind of goes both ways. And people in the parish push you on this a lot. They want to know, well, what is it? Are these Baptists are they heretics or are they just like misdiluted a little bit? And they're going to be curious about these things. And what about Catholics too? And the answer is, it depends on where you start. If you're going to start from the standpoint of love and putting the best construction on things and recognizing that when the gospel is present, then Christ is present and that's enough, then you would say, yes, they're in the church and they're brothers in the faith. Everything's fine. Well, not fine, but they're in the faith. But if you're going to start from the standpoint of truth, then you would say, wow, well, wait a minute, truth is truth. They've got something out of line here. They're, mis they're out of step with their regular fide. They're misrepresenting what God has actually done. So therefore, they are in error, and error is false worship. False worship is idolatry. They're in serious position. So you can, you can go both ways with it. And in a sense, both answers are accurate and both are right. Um, depending on your personality or depending on how you operate, you're going to tend to, towards one or the other. But I think it's important to hang on to both. 
And we need to keep both things in perspective because on one hand, yes, they're in the faith and we don't need to treat them as you know, heretics. And they're not heretics, they're heterodox. But on the other hand, their errors are significant enough that they can't absolutely destroy faith and they're not just little trivial things. So that's why that tension I think is helpful. So we don't, we don't trivialize them, or we don't trivialize their errors because they matter, but at the same time we don't just embrace them you know, or, or just kind of cut them off. So we have this sense of, yes, you're in the faith, but I'm really concerned about what's going on here. So we don't have this, doesn't matter, we're all in Jesus, who cares, the kind of ecumenical you know, watering everything down, or the only we're right, leave us all alone kind of arrogance. That's wrong too. Both errors are wrong. And the tension helps you keep from falling into either one. And I guess nowadays, probably the um, let's all just be friends and hold hands is probably the um, bigger error. So I'm a little more concerned about that. So I kind of lean towards the truth side. But you have to be careful not to get carried away there too. All right, good? Yes? I, I thought uh, Peeper had a little bit of theodicy going on. Oh, maybe. Yeah, there's some of that. I mean, there's that uh, effort to do some of this. Now, and realize that there is even a place for some theotic, theotical or theodicy sort of thinking, even within the faith. But that needs to be in the context of, let's talk about how we understand these things happening around us, and let's do it from the standpoint of Christian faith. And if you're doing it within Christian faith, you can recognize that, yes, there are indeed things that sometimes happen which aren't maybe what they thought they were going to be, and that God actually brings these things to a good c conclusion. And in a sense, you might say that's a theodicy. But if you're doing it in the context of faith and you're not doing it to explain God or let God off the hook, it's not a big danger. But there are some things where, yeah, there's some of that kind of going on a little bit. Yeah. All right. Yes, Joel? It seems like um, the Odyssey also can come about not necessarily by being incorrect, but when you're applying the state said statements where, you know, I, I go back to Job, for example. I mean, I, those guys, those, those friends of Job, they weren't necessarily saying wrong, incorrect things about right. God. Right, right. But they, how they were applying them at that point in time was... Right. And see, that's, that's one of, that is probably where you're going, to, you're going with the Peeper thing you noticed, and this is also there. You have this sense that sometimes it's, um, he's saying things which are true enough, but really don't solve the problem. For example, he he's in a big discussion, and we'll get there eventually. Well, I want to talk about it when we get there, because I'll do it now. Um, to distinguish God's foreknowledge from God foreordaining something makes a big deal. You know, just because God knows something doesn't mean it's going to happen. But... Kind of. It does. I mean, now, and so we make a distinction. So we do this often. Well, God knew you are going to fall down the stairs, but he didn't make you fall down the stairs. And that's true. From a systematic standpoint, that's true. But from an existential, I'm just living in this world trying to figure out why bad things happen, it gets you nowhere. It doesn't give you, it doesn't give, advance you one step. Because then you can say, well, just be, okay, God foreknew it, but he didn't make it happen right. But couldn't he have stopped it? Well, Yeah then why didn't he? So you're right back to the same exact problem. And so your systematic you know, effort to say, now, was the difference between foreknowledge and forewilling and making these things happen? True enough, that's true, but it really doesn't solve the problem. That's what we're getting at is there's a time to have that kind of discussion, like in a Bible class setting or when you're trying to think things through, but not in a, an emergency room and not in a crisis. That's not the time for those kinds of distinctions. So they're really not helpful. Is that what you're kind of getting at? Yeah. All right. Okay, good. Now, so, Peeper's going to get into this whole discussion then about God's essence and attributes, and he makes the uh, uh, point that he says, it is of no real consequence in which order these parts of doctrine are treated. This is 427, right off the bat. And he says, it doesn't matter if you start with the Trinity or with God's essence. Now, you know, Lacuna is kicking like crazy. saying, oh, it matters. <laughs> in fact, start with the Trinity or you're going to get all goofed up. I remember that was how she faulted Aquinas for starting, or um, for the later theologians starting with, you know, just the doctrine of God. Or even Aquinas, she has concerns with him doing this. But then notice what Peter does later that same paragraph. The very last part of 427, the last five lines. Chemnitz, therefore, very properly shows at the very outset, in his Loki de Deo in Genere, that without the knowledge of Christ and the Trinity, man's knowledge of God is really ignoratio dei. You can guess what that is, as far as the practical result. That is the worship of God. Now, this is exactly right. So what is Chemnitz saying? That you can't start with a generic God. You've got to start with God in Christ or you get nothing. In fact, you get an idol. So actually, Chemnitz is talking Laconia language here, and Pieper quotes it. So Pieper kind of denies what he just said above. He says it doesn't really matter what you do, but you've got to really start with Christ, and that's exactly the right thing. So it just needs to be maybe a little, little tighter there. All right. 
Good. So now he's going to get into the, some of these things we can know about God and how we're going to talk about God. And he's going to make these, this um, ex- exploration into how we're going to be able to talk about God's very nature and, and explore these a little bit. Um, page 431, he has a, a nice little quote here. He says, this is starting at the very bottom of 430. And my plan is here today, we've got time here, we're just going to crank through Peeper, and I'm going to fold in a couple Odin things. You didn't have to read the Odin stuff, but Odin's treating the same stuff, basically. That's why I didn't make you read him. But he does have a couple things he does pretty well, and I'll just highlight those for you when we get there. Um, So if you have something I'm skipping over when I start flying through pages, stick your hand up and ask. It is indeed a foolish and blasphemous undertaking when we men, on an a priori basis, independent of God's self-revelation in His Word, Presume to determine what God, according to his love or righteousness, can or ought to do, or what is or is not compatible with God's love or justice. This attempt rests on the false premise that finite man can comprehend the infinite God. The fact is that as God is infinite, so also his attributes are infinite and therefore beyond our comprehension. Now that's nicely said. We can't presume to know God, and we get into big trouble when we try to shove God into our box. And he makes that nice distinction here again between an a priori way of doing things or an a posteriori. And remember, he doesn't talk about all that here, but that's the same idea going on here. All right? And so the a priori is when we have assumptions going in. God has to do it like this. Or God should this be this way because God has to be this. And when we start having those kinds of a priori things, which we talked about, remember, are based primarily on reason, or you might even say logic, which is a subset there, rather than a posteriori, which would be based on revelation and on what God is actually showing us in Christ and in his written word. So which one's going to be the foundation here? This is going to be really important when we get to issues, especially like the immutability of God. Really a big deal on those kinds of things. Because immutability, if we have an a priori definition of immutability, God can't change. Well, that creates some really significant issues for us when we actually deal with what he does in Revelation. But we'll get there in a minute. Okay, um, then we diss the nominalists and for their univocal use of language, that's fine. Um, Footnote 4th on 432, footnote 62, long footnote all about Quenstedt. And you remember enough from Plaker that Quenstedt was one of his problem guys. And you actually see here where he's making some moves towards the univocal use of, of language. Right smack in the middle of that footnote. I won't overdo this, but we use the term analogy, alogike, when things have, done both, have both the name and the matter in common, however, in an unequal degree. The one having the name and the matter in a primary absolute way, then in a secondary way. So he's already taken this to a univocal sense of proportionality, you see. Remember, that was the move that Suarez made and then Scotus made. That's the same thing going on here in Quenstedt. So just be aware of that. That was some of the things that Plaker was talking about. Okay, good. So on then to talking about God. And we're going to talk about the classification of the divine attributes. And Pieper says there are lots of ways you can start kind of categorizing the attributes. Before we get into the categorization, though, we need to remember a couple things. When we start talking about God's attributes, what are we really talking about? We're not talking about descriptors of God, and we're not talking about aspects of God, right? We need to be aware of the fact that God is his attributes. He doesn't have attributes. He is his attributes. He is his attributes. Now, this gets a little bit kind of goofy, but we need to remember this because we're talking about God here. And one of the reasons that this is going on is one of the very first things we're going to say about God, and that is the fact that God is simple, or that we talk about the simplicity of God. Now, we already encountered this term in Plaker, so it's not unfamiliar to you, but the idea of simple does not mean easy to figure out as opposed to really hard. Like, well, there's nothing simple about this. What we mean is that there are no component parts. There's no complexity. It's not like you take all these things together and put them together, and now we have God. God just is God. And so God doesn't have justice and benevolence and mercy and omnipotence. God is all of those things all at once, all the time. God just is. And that's what we're getting at with the simplicity of God. No parts. No parts to God. No aspects, no individual ideas. It's just God's godness. And there's another term that Pieper doesn't use much here, but um, Odin does, and it's kind of a nice term. And this is the idea of talking about God's aseity, 
which maybe is unfamiliar to you, but it's a good term. term. Aseity comes from the Latin root, which would be ase, which is from itself. From itself. And what we mean by God's aseity is that God is underived and totally independent, not contingent in any way at all. That's the aseity. So there's no contingency. And by, I use this term quite a bit when I talk about contingency. You know what I'm talking about here now? If you know, even though legally, a contingency is you're trying to buy a house and it's a contingency on the, on the loan or on the deal. That means it depends on something else. And so when I'm talking about contingency, I'm talking about our human lives, and I say we are contingent, what I mean is we are always interrelated and dependent on others. For our very existence, for our ongoing life, everything is contingent. Anything that is created is contingent on other created things. God is not contingent. The aseity, he exists in himself, independent of any kind of interrelationship. He doesn't need anything else. He doesn't derive from anything else. He just is. And what we're getting at here with both of these things, essentially, is this idea of pure being. That God simply is his very self. And now we... Fast forward to Exodus 20, or actually before Exodus 20, Exodus 6 or something like that, where Moses ends up out on this Mount Sinai and encounters the burning bush, and he says, Who are you? And God says, I am that I am. In Charlton Heston voice, you know. And then it's all tremulous. Because that's how it sounds. Um, but what's the point of this? God is saying, I just am. And the very Hebrew name for God, the Tetragrammaton, right? Yahweh means, well, we're not sure, but it seems to derive most closely to the verb to be. He is. He just is. He exists. So Yahweh, God is. I am. He's just being. What more can you say? It's, the, it's about as close as you get. So definitions of God, what does people say? Good idea, bad idea? Bad idea. Can't do it. Peeper even says this. Plaker says it. Peeper agrees. Definitions of God are impossible. We can't define God, but what can we do? We can describe him. So we're not going to be able to define God, but we can describe him. And what are we going to describe him on? Not based on a priori stuff. That's no good. What are we going to describe him on? Yeah, on the revelation. What he's actually done in the economy. And that's where the attributes come from. So when we start talking about the attributes, those are derived from what he's actually done and shown in the economy of salvation. So the attributes we get, the attributes we start listing out, are coming from the economy. It's important, I think, that you take some time to explain this and stress this when you're teaching the attributes, because there's a tendency when you're doing Little Blue and you're cranking along with your eighth graders, and you go, okay, let's talk about God today, and you start running through the attributes. And you get boom, 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 list of proof text. Next one, list of proof text. And just crank it through. There, that's what God is. And the kids are like, where did this all come from? Well, it's from the Bible. Well, the better thing to say is God has shown himself in you know, his actions with us. And because he's shown himself, we are able to understand that God shows us these characteristics. And this tells us something about God. So we begin to understand what God is like based on how he operates. And that's why we are able to say these things. And you teach them that kind of reverence and reticence to speak too much or say too, too confidently things. All right, so the simplicity of God, the aseity of God, these things are, are foundational. Everything we do coming afterwards always needs to be done in the context of God's God. He's different than us. He's simple. He's numerically one. That's another phrase we'll get to here in a little bit. He's numerically one. And so in his essence, there is only one God. There's no God stuff, and then different things participate in it. And that's why his godness is different than our humanness. Our humanness, we all share. So there's how many billion examples of humanness? There's only one God thing. There's only one God, and that's God. God's essence and God's being are one. So the simplicity, the aseity, the numerically one, all this is getting at his, his one, unified, simple, profound, perfect, unchanging being. Godness. Okay? Okay. You're all looking at me like, whatever. Okay. Now, so we go into our list of attributes, and Pieper says there are all kinds of ways you can think about the attributes, but two have become dominant, right? 
And he says the two dominant ways of thinking about the attributes of God are to either go with the negative and then the positive attributes, or you can go with the quiescent and operative attributes. So these are kind of your, your two options, your two approaches to thinking about how God operates and how God is and how these attributes work. So when we're thinking about negative positive, what do we have in mind? This is not negative bad, positive good. Like God is wrathful, negative. God is nice, positive. That's not what we're doing here. So get that out of your mind and you got to think a little differently here, okay? Mary. Yes, that's what we're after here. Negative positive would be things that apply and things that don't apply. So the negative, and this has to do with um, in relation to creatures. And that's pretty much, to be honest, that's what both of these are saying. In relation to creatures, there are positive and negative attributes of God. The negative are the ones that do not apply to creatures in any way at all. The positive attributes are the ones that apply to creatures in some way. And that would be your analogous sort of a thing. So that's what we mean by negative positive. So negative is don't apply, and the positive is they do in some way apply. All right, now what about quiescent operative? What's going on there? It's a little bit tougher to get your mind around, but quiescent and operative. Quiescent means what? This is actually a word in the dictionary. It's not just a theological term. Quiescent, what's it mean? Yeah, retiring, laid back, tending not to speak, not, not intervening. So just being um, like laid back um, would be a quiescent. So we just kind of let things happen. It comes from the word quiet, it's the same root there. So quiescent is retiring, laying back, not, not being active. Operative, of course, is making things happen. So when we're thinking about quiescent attributes versus the operative attributes, what we have in mind here, what theologians have in mind is those attributes which are true of God in and of himself, even when he's not interacting with the creation, then the operative are those attributes that are seen in evidence when he interacts with his creation. And so what you might say, now we're going to make Lacuna get all annoyed here, is the quiescent are dealing with the imminent trinity and the operative are dealing with the economic trinity. But of course, because of Rahner's rule, which you all remember, right in the tip of your tongue, which you should remember. Hint, hint, hint. Okay. Um, click away, right? Sit down. Rahner's rule. All right. So, the Rahner's rule tells us anything we know about the imminent trinity comes from where? Yeah, the economic trinity. We only know about God because of what he's done. But when we know about what God is, we recognize there are some things that are true of God regardless whether it's a creation or not. It's just there. Okay? So, for example, the infinity of God. God's infinite, whether he's, you know, whether there's another thing else or not. And God is simple, whether there's a creation or not. And God has a satiety, whether there's a creation or not. Those would all be quiescent attributes. But God's mercy, well, mercy, he has, he has to have something to be merciful toward. So the mercy only becomes, at, you know, in evidence in relation to the creation. So that would be operative. Okay? All right. Now, of these two categories, which one does Peeper opt, opt for? What's that? <coughs> Negative positive. This is one that Peeper goes with. And what's he think of this one? It's fine. He said, he don't care. Take it any way you want. So it really doesn't matter. Now, why doesn't this matter? It doesn't matter because all these lists of attributes are really just human efforts at trying to unpack something. We're, we're cooking this stuff up. We're the ones coming up with it. So how you order it, how you, how you relate it, really doesn't matter that much at all. And that's his point. And I think he's on the right track there. All right, so he says it really doesn't matter how you're going to go about classifying them, just so long as you, you know, kind of do this carefully and proceed, proceed accordingly. All right, 436, very bottom of the page, end of the um, last full paragraph, he says, in making this comparison between human and divine attributes, we dare never go beyond Scripture, good, nor forget the infinite chasm between God and man for all attributes, regardless of the division, belong to God in a unique manner. Yay! All right, Francis. Yeah, this is good. This is good. So, Plaker's been reading Peeper, you see. Because <laughs> Peeper came first. All right, so credit where credit is due. 
All right, so this is nicely said. Now, again, I think this is probably has more to do with Peeper's pre-modern disposition than anything else. Yes, there are some modern example things going on with Peeper. He's been influenced to some extent, but he's still very pre-modern in most of how he's operating, and that emphasis is a very pre-modern way of looking at things. All right, so away we go. Negative attributes, and these are the things that we will not see in man in any way possible, at any, at any way. So he just starts ticking off his list then. First one he's got is the unity of God. So by the unity of God, that's the sense of the numerical oneness. There's only one God, and there's only one God thing, so he is numerically one. This is his point here. And this is also important for Peeper. He's always trying to talk about the, the practical value of things, and Peeper's really good at this, is um, thinking about the, the usefulness of doctrine, and he's, he's surprisingly good at this. Um, some of the counsel he gives you, which is very down-to-earth and very practical. So on 438 he says, the doctrine of God's unity, first full paragraph, has great practical value for two reasons. The earnest admonition to cling only to this one God with undivided allegiance. So we have this sense that this is the one God, so give him your, authority, your allegiance. And then the second, comfort. That no person, no event can harm us if God is on our side. If God's only one, dualities are gone. See, any, any idea of this kind of Manichaean, that ancient you know, heresy of, of dualism, where you got, and you get this all over the place in the world today. I mean, the yin and yang stuff you see all over the place. You know, kids wear it around their necks. You know, they're yin and yang. Oh, it means balance. No, it means false dualism. You're a Manichaean. Take it off. You know, don't let your kids wear it to confirmation class. Be really ruthless about it. <laughs> oh, it means harmony and balance. No, it's a false, idolatrous symbol of Manichaean dualism. What are you, a Star Wars nut or something? Dark side of the force and, you know, this kind of thing. See, it's, 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 it's not true. God is not balanced by some kind of equal, opposite God force, and they just fight all the time. That's not true. God's God. That's it. Everything else is a creature. Everything else is submissive. Everything else. There's only God. So yin-yang stuff is out, and dualisms are out. All right. Middle of that same page, he says it very nicely. We don't, there's no definition of God. Then at the bottom, we get this really well said. We don't define God, but we should formulate a description of God. And that's a very nice distinction. So it's a 438 where he gives you this. All right, his second term he goes to, after unity, is simplicity. We've already introduced that and talked about that a bit. So this is his second word, is simplicity. God doesn't have parts. And then he uses these nice two words here that you should be familiar with. He talks about how anytime we're talking about God in a sense of having an, a strong arm or a heart or getting angry or even having compassion, all of those are anthropomores. And you should be familiar with these words even from your um, entrance exam, I think. Anthropo, and so now we can put on two endings. Anthropomorphism is one, or an anthropo. Pathism. So, these are both words you should be familiar with. Anthropomorphism, anthropopathism. A lot of people have heard anthropomorphism, but maybe have not heard the second one, anthropopathism, but they're both legitimate. They're both good uses. And anthropomorphism simply means that we are taking man, anthropus, human forms or shapes and applying them to God. And an anthropopathism is taking human passions or emotions or feelings and applying them to God. So you have to realize when the scripture talks about, you know, God's strong right arm, well, God doesn't have an arm, okay? He's God, but we know what he's, we're getting at here and we're anthropomorphizing God for the sake of our ability to comprehend him. And even to talk about God's compassion, well, you know, okay, that's a human emotion. Does God have emotions? The Bible says yes, but then God's God and He's holy other. And so we recognize that most of these things are examples. Again, this kind of gets to Nate's first question this, right off the bat today. This kind of gets back again to God lisping to us and God trying to come down to our level and trying to accommodate us. And that's kind of what you got going on here. So anthropomorphisms, anthropopathisms are all examples of God getting down to our level, just for our benefit. Okay. Good. And these are, and that's important all the way through this. 439, God himself has condescended to us, divided himself, as it were, into component parts, and because of our finite intellectual intellect permits us to conceive of God's attributes for our benefit. So even to talk about attributes is really for our benefit, and we're, we're trying to pull God down into a, in a way that is somewhat 
descriptive, that is helpful, but we have to always know that in his simplicity and his aseity, he's wholly other. Very bottom of that page footnote, Luther, we are at our wit's end when we try to define God. Yes, Luther, exactly right. That was nicely said. Okay, now we get to the immutability of God. And this is where it becomes so important to be careful that we are doing a posteriori revelation-based work and not a priori assumed this is the way God has to work, work. The immutability of God means what? God does not change. God does not change. Now, if we take this in an a priori way, we would say, God doesn't change. Well, we've got some problems, don't we? We've got problems with the incarnation. And it's not just, we say, well, okay, the Father didn't change, just the Son changed. But see, now that we're Trinitarian, that's not going to help us at all. But we even have other issues because it goes further. Because now the incarnation actually teaches that God becomes one with flesh and has actually brought human flesh into the Godhead. More on this next quarter. But that's what we confess. <laughs> that's what we confess that there's humanity in the Godhead. Is that a change? Boy, it looks that way to me. And then there are other issues, though. We don't have to go to the incarnation. How does God answer prayer? Think about that. So he listens to you pray, and then he says, oh, that was a really good prayer. I think I'll do that now, since you asked. So wait a minute. Did he change because of your prayer? You would seem to think so. Now we go even further. What about actually even listening to your prayer? To actually listen to you do something implies change in God because something was happening now that wasn't happening before. And if something's different from now to then, guess what? That's called change. There's some big issues here. And this is one of the reasons why the philosophers in the ancient world who were doing a priori thinking about God had big problems with stuff. And that's where Gnosticism came from. One of the reasons for it, we can think about Gnostic being anti-material, but one of the other things in Gnosticism was, if the material world's evil, and God's perfect, and God doesn't change, how do, you get a, how do you get a world? How do you get anything? How does God create if he can't change? Because if God speaks something into existence, he just did something, and that means there's change. He can't do anything besides think about himself. That's why Aristotle has the unmoved mover, thinking always about nothing but himself, because anything else would be change. Can't have it. Unmoved mover. Got to have a ground. What do we get in the Bible? Completely different picture. God hears prayer. God listens to prayer. God changes his mind. He's going to wipe out Nineveh. Nope, guess I won't. And Jonah's like, rats. <laughs> so what's going on? Now, if you're going to play a univocal game, you say, well, it just appears that God changed his mind. He's really not. Or God was just kind of telling Jonah he was going to, but he really wasn't going to. So he didn't change anything, and he knew how it was all going to play out anyway. So you can go that route. Yeah, that creates other problems. Like, was God budging the truth? Well, it seems that way. And so you, can, you just create more problems for you. Or you can go a different route. And this is the route that I think Plaker would have us think about. And this is the route I think we should think about. God is God. And he is completely, wholly other. And he is completely unchanging in his character. And yet his unchanging character absolutely engages and interacts with this creation. And when he does that, he does that without diminishing his own character in any way at all. As part of his character is his ability to come into the creation. And think about this in terms of the incarnation. In the incarnation, God remains fully God Lord of the universe, and yet limits himself by being joined to human flesh. And yet he can still be the Lord of the universe. He can do this, and we confess this, but that's part of the, the blow-your-mind mystery of the Incarnation. That how can God, who is God, be here in this guy? And yet that's what we confess. Well, Odin and Peeper both make the same kind of connection. They say the way we confess that is also how we can think about God actually intervening in the affairs of men and listening to prayers and coming to people and showing up at the burning bush. So the God enters into time much as God enters into human flesh. So he steps into time, walks with us in time for a while, hears our prayer, listens to our concerns, and then is also still being God wholly outside of time and fully supreme and fully immutable. 
But what we have to realize, though, is our definition of immutability has to be based on the revelation and not on a priori assumptions about what it can, what it means not to change. Because the best way to focus on this, then, is that God's character is consistent. His character does not change. And so God and His Godness is always going to be the same God, and that's why we can count on His promises being kept and on the certainty of His Word. His character does not change. And that's actually where people goes with this, and that's the better way to do it. Any attempt to try to say, well, this, God is doing this and that, I think almost always starts to limp and falls prey to the kind of univocal theodicy sort of stuff. Nathan. Um, who are the canonics, and why is it bad to teach that the... Um, that the son actually empties himself yeah. when he takes on the form of Christ instead of just like staying a lot aloof like nothing happens. Yeah, this is systems two stuff, and we'll get more of that. Kenosis is the word that um, St. Paul uses in Philippians for Jesus emptying himself. Right. Okay, and so the canonics were a group of people, and there are different forms of kenosis, canonics. But some of the canonics said that um, God had to um, leave behind some of his godness to become incarnate. And so that there's an emptying of God's full godness. And this is part of what Calvinism teaches with the extra Calvinisticum, that there's um, more to God than would, have, than would fit in Jesus. And so he left some of his godness behind. Um, Lutheran theology teaches, no, that's not the way to understand the kenosis. The right way to understand God's, the emptying of Christ is not the not having the powers, but the non-use of the powers, which is a big difference. So we would say that Jesus is fully, completely God. He has all the Godhead in him, but he's not using the full Godhead. Whereas the canonics were saying that, no, he's not even completely fully God because he couldn't, couldn't, a human body couldn't handle it. That's the um, finitum non capax infinity, the finite's not capable of infinite. More on that. Spring quarter. I know, I just keep on postponing you guys, but it all comes together eventually. All right, good? Yes, Merritt. When it comes to the temptation of Christ, I remember someone in my church at one point had a big problem because it's like, well, if Christ can't change, then right. therefore he wasn't really tempted yeah. because he wasn't going to sin. Yeah. But yeah. if we say, you know, so how do we handle that one? Or is that just something that you just, we don't get it? That's just systems know. too. Okay. <laughs> no, that is. That is we, we, are gonna, we will talk about that more. But the, the, the quick answer, because I don't want to postpone you forever, the quick answer would be to say that Jesus' temptation is a very real temptation, but his experience of, of tempting is very different than ours because he's without sin, and it's a different kind of experience for us. And so we'll talk about that more because okay. that gets a little bit thick, actually. All right, good. Infinity. Infinity is also on this list of negative attributes. But wait, aren't we infinite? Don't we have an infinite soul? What's Peter say? How's he help with this, Chris? Oh, I uh, uh, can't quite remember that, but... Um, <laughs> well, go ahead then. Anybody can help here. Why not? Yeah, we have a beginning, Bill. But we have no ending. Yeah, this is the big difference. We have no ending. Our souls are immortal, but we've got a start point. There was a time when I was not. God has no start point, so his infinity is very different than ours. So he, in fact... Only God is truly infinite. Only God is truly infinite. We have a beginning point, which means we're less than infinite. And what is also nice to think about is actually infinity is better seen as really a subset of immeasurability. And Odin goes this route, and I think this is a helpful way to think about this, that, and even Peter talks about this, immeasurability is a better way to think about this. And then there's two aspects to this. We can talk about God's infinity, and we can talk about God's immensity. And immensity doesn't mean really, really, really huge. Wow, he's an immense God. He's big. You know, he's really big. And that's not what we're talking about here. The infinity of God means that he is outside of time. Time can't constrain him. And the immensity of God is the location or the um, place, that there is no place that can contain God. So he is outside of time and he is outside of place. He is infinite in regard to time. And he is immense in regard to place. He just fills it all and supersedes it all. There is nothing to spatially contain God. So the universe exists. And then when the universe stops, then what? Then God. Just God is there. And this really blows your mind because, you know, the universe can't be infinite. Even though people talk that way, space is infinite. No, it can't be, because it's created. If it's created, it has a beginning, and it has limits. 
So there's a spart, part somewhere way out there where universe ends. Boom. And that's it. What's beyond it? <laughs> just God. And if you try to go past it, you just bump up against it. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Yes, Nathan. Um, it could be, yes. That's a little bit contrastive. So don't go too far with that analogy. Yeah, it's quite contrastive. God just is. Yeah. All right. So the infinity of God, the immensity of God, got that covered. Then we go to the omnipresence of God. So God is present everywhere. And this is where Odin gives um, a nice little input here on this idea of omnipresence and how God can be present. So God is omnipresent, present everywhere. People aren't. By the way, this is um, something we'll talk about again more later. I'm thinking it'll come up when we do our creation stuff and Satan. But only God is omnipresent. No creature is omnipresent. Satan is not omnipresent. And you hear Christians talk sometimes. They talk like he is. But he's not. And you hear Christians talk sometimes, and he starts to almost become a dualism. God and Satan. And Satan can do everything God can do. He reads minds, and he, he's present everywhere. No, he's not. He's a creature. He's bound. He's limited. He's not omnipresent. He's only one place at a time. And he's got plenty of you know, helpers with him who can be all over the place. But Satan himself can only be one place, one time. Okay? Yeah, Joel? So when we... Uh, uh, obviously, you're going to get to this. So when we say Satan... We're, we're assuming just to demonic forces some of the time when we're speaking about Yeah, them. yeah. We're really talking about more demonic forces. And if we're going to be more accurate in our language, you probably should just say, you know, de demonic forces or satanic forces would be more accurate rather than Satan himself. Who knows if Satan's been around. Maybe you've met him, maybe you haven't. Who knows? But you've certainly met some of his, his minions and his, his forces. Those are very much present. There's a difference, though. Yeah. Okay? And that, that's helpful because it just keeps our perspective right keeps him in his place a little bit. All right, so on to the omnipresence. So this omnipresence means God is present everywhere. But how and in what ways? Odin lists off several different ways of thinking about God's presence in the creation. So he says, and this is Odin's um, list, kind of starting with the most basic to the more broad. So, is God present in my marking pen? Yeah. Is God present in your desk? Sure. God present in the tree out there? Yes. How much of God is in my marking pen? Yes, all of him. Because he's not present by extension. Yeah, you had to think about that. All of him? You're so confident, Jeff. Um, he's present everywhere, all of them, all the time, and not by extension. And what that means is it's not like taking gold leaf and pounding it really, really thin and spreading it over everything or stretching something out so that one billionth of God is right here, there, there. I just touched a little bit of God. No! <laughs> He's all there. He's everywhere, always, all of Him. And it's not by extension. It's not like you have to kind of spread Him thin. You know, oh boy, He's really being spread thin. No, God's just present in all places at all times. He's omnipresent. All right, so Odin says God, first off, is naturally present in all things. So just by the fact that nature exists and that it sustains itself, God is present there to sustain it. So God is in the rock, and God's in the tree, and God's in the mountain, and God's in the swamp, and God's in the cute little piggy, and God's everywhere. No doubt about it. He's in all things. God's present. He's everywhere. And is he present even in unclean things? Peter has a nice section here, quoting from Luther. Yes, absolutely. Because otherwise, what happens when we're in really bad spots do we have to wonder if God's present? God is present everywhere, nowhere where he's not. This brings us tremendous comfort. And you've got scripture to support it. Even in the depths of Sheol, you are there. Pretty cool. So God's everywhere. All right, so that's naturally present. Second way that God is present would be he is attentively present. This is Odin's next level. Attentively present to those who call upon his name or pray. So, you know, God help this person. Is God present for you when you're praying to him? Yes, he is attentively present in your prayer. And then God is present also judicially, or judicially present through moral awareness or through conscience so that when you have a sense of right or wrong or feel like you've just violated some rule and you feel like, oh, God's really on me, God on my back, that's God being judicially present. So not in a very nice way, but he's certainly present and you are very aware of that. Okay? Then God can also be bodily present. What are we thinking about now? Wow, you guys are being good Lutherans. Yeah, Eucharist, Lord's Supper, but where would we go before that even? Yeah, the Incarnation. 
So during Christ's 30 years, whatever, how many years exactly ministry, he is bodily present. God is present. See, think about that. So God is present, Emmanuel, in Christ, but wasn't he present also before Christ became incarnate? Sure. So wasn't he in the boat? Was God in the boat before Jesus jumped in? Yeah, but so now he's present bodily. So there's a difference here. And it's helpful to think about this. All right, then we can talk about God being mystically present, where he's present with his believers. You know, this the mystical union. And here Odin drops the ball because he talks about God being mystically present in the Eucharist. Shame on him. Yeah. <laughs> symbol, symbol, symbol. Shame on him. But what do we expect? He's a Baptist, so he's going to have his problems. And here's where he limps. But I would say he's actually, I would say he's sacramentally present. Or even you can go with bodily, you know, the corporal or the present. But sacramentally present, probably even better. And you can also say that God is sacredly present when he promises to be present, like in word and sacrament or through the preaching. And, the, and see, I would probably say sacredly or sacramentally would be about the same thing. And yesterday we suggested another way God might be present, which would be like vocationally present, so that when I'm serving others and caring for them, or when they present their need to me and I see my brother's need and I realize that's really Christ's, you know, is that need there. So when I'm serving him, Matthew 25, Christ is actually present in that service. So you can talk about God being vocationally present. So all these are really helpful, and this is useful because this helps us to be careful not to confuse things. Because people say, well, God's present everywhere, so what's the big deal about praying? Well, then you're, because it's a different kind of presence. It's a different way of God being present. And we need to keep that distinction. It's helpful as we're um, sorting these things out. And like I said, Odin does a nice job of that. It's on page 68 if you want to cross-reference that or check it out. All right. Good. So he's present everywhere without extension. And um, Peter has this nice quote from Luther on 444. that It's not like taking a big sack and stuffing it full of straw in there. That's how God is present. No, he's just present everywhere in his full being. And that's exactly the way it is. But he's actually other than his being as well. He's not just present as identifying with the creation because we're not pantheists or panentheists. And by the way, also we have to realize that this, sometimes we talk about God's ubiquity is in this omnipresence. Remember, omni is just Latin for everywhere or all. So the omnipresence of God Sometimes we talk about the ubiquity, and this is the idea of God's presence in nature, that he is everywhere and everything all the time, the ubiquity. And sometimes Calvinists or Reformed theologians assume that that's why we believe that Jesus is present in the Lord's Supper. That's not what we believe. And Christ is not present in the Lord's Supper just because of ubiquity. Christ is present in the Lord's Supper because of the sacramental promise. But more on that, Systems 3. All right. So omni just means all or everything. And that's why, they, by the way, that's where we get the word bust. You probably didn't know that maybe. I, a bus is just short for omnibus, and omnibus means all-encompassing. How about that? Um, how, which one of those would we ascribe to the Holy Spirit being inside us? That's Probably the mystical presence. The mystical presence of Christ. The Holy Spirit indwelling us with the mystical presence, the union between God and the believer through, through the Spirit's presence. That would be the mystical presence. Yes, Stephanie? Uh, I don't understand what good it is to say the different ways that God is present. Um, he's present everywhere. We're, it seems like we're dividing God again. Yeah, it, we're, we're thinking about the way he's promising to keep his, the way he promises to be with us, the way he keeps his promises. And it's not so much to what we're trying to define God, divide God, as we're helping people to recognize the importance of our Christian piety, in a sense, why the Lord's Supper is more is important, because now he's sacramentally present with me in a way that he's not present with me just walking through the woods. So this is, this is going to be really helpful to you in the ministry, actually. So someone's going to say, hey, I can go out and walk in the woods, and I feel God's presence. Okay. But you say, but when you come to the Lord's Supper, he's bodily present. Yeah, but he's present there, too. Yeah, but there's a difference, you see. And the difference is the promise, it's, it's in a sense more intense or more certain and more, more um, tangible at the rail than it is out there in the woods. And so that's, the, that's where the helpful thing is. It's kind of like concentric rings of way of God's being present. And all of them matter. But the one is to, to emphasize where God has made a special promise, and those things are even more important to us. Okay? Okay. You don't seem convinced. Uh, not really. I mean, it seems like we're talking about nine, like degrees of God's presence. In a sense, we are. But these are things that he has made clear to us. So we're not making them up. These are things he has said, that he is present in the body of believers. So I am there with you. Or two or three are gathered there, am I in the midst of you? Well, what's different about that than when we weren't two or three? Why is two or three better than one? Well, there's something different about that promise, and because he's attached a promise to it, there is an, a greater awareness of his presence or a greater certainty of his presence, and that's what makes it better. So it, it really, it's a practical thing. It's the application of how, how it applies to us. 
Yeah. When uh, we talk about it being judicious, judiciously present, yeah. um, is that the same thing as middle of page 445 where they talk about practical doctrine is revealed for our warning for there is no place where God does not see? Is that judicial? Yes, that would be an example of judicial presence, yes. Yes, agreed. Page 444, outstanding quote, outstanding quote from Luther, right in the middle of the page. A human body is much, much too large for the Godhead. In fact, many thousand Godheads could find ample room in one human body. On the other hand, one body is far too small for only one Godhead. Nothing is so small, God is still smaller. Nothing so large, God is still larger. Nothing so short, God is still shorter. Nothing so long, God is still longer. Nothing so wide, God is still wider. Nothing so narrow, God is still narrower. In short, God's being is so far above and beyond words and thought that it is simply indescribable. Hey, for Luther. I mean, that's awesome. That's really good stuff. So is God in the quark? Yes. Yes. And does God fill the universe and extend the universe? Yes. Wow. God's just cool. Now, going back to the practical aspect. What is the practical aspect of the omnipresence? Peeper says, hey, it cuts two ways, law and gospel. So you tell the kids where mom and dad are going away tonight, remember, God is watching. <laughs> is that legit? Yeah. Absolutely. And if somebody says, whoa, God's watching me, I better not do this. My dad, you know, helps out in um, a pre-K class, and my dad's 80-something now, and he helps out with the pre-K kids. And he talks about this one little boy he's been dealing with who um, has some issues with behavior, so he'll take, take him aside. So my dad's a, a pastor, a retired pastor, and they have talks. And this little boy's convinced that when he goes in the closet and closes the door, God can't see him. And um, so <laughs> it's just this ongoing theological debate he has with my dad about whether, um, whether God can actually see him there. But he can and the omnipresence of God, in the law sense, just kind of keeps you in check. And this is not something just for little kids, by the way. I mean, to even realize that when you're alone and no one's watching, God's there with you. And that should help control behavior. That's not a bad thing. Now, what about the gospel side of the omnipresence? Yeah. No matter what's going on or where you are or how horrible things are, you're not alone. God's with you, and that's tremendously comforting. So it goes both ways. And there are so many doctrines that work this way. There's a, there's a law aspect to it, and there's a gospel aspect to it. It's just one truth, but it has different applications depending on what you want to do with it or what needs to be done. Okay, good? Yep, Nathan. Is there a way we should talk about the God's absence? Um, yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing. That would be primarily where God pulls himself back. And he absents himself. That's the absconding God who hides himself in that sense of God's absence, which is never um, a natural thing, but an a unnatural thing because of God's deliberate choice. Yeah. But is it only an appearance? Um, yes and no. I think that's probably true. I mean, God fills all things. And if he didn't, they would cease to be. And so the absence of God is more our experience of God's apparent um, non-presence. Yeah. Yes. Can you give an example where God abstained or made himself absent? Um, only from experience, Francis. I mean, you're not gonna, I'm not going to be able to give you one definitively, well, God wasn't there. Um, but when a crisis happens and the people say, God, where are you? And he pulls himself back. And the best one I can come up with would probably be Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the son looks to the father, and at that moment, the father is absent. And that's pretty, pretty good, probably the best time I can think of, about the only time. Okay? All right, so we talk about the eternity of God, and this is very kind of parallel to his infinity, that he is eternal without any change, without any end, without any start. So he just goes on. All right, so that's it for our negatives. Now we go to our positive attributes. And these are going to be the ones where we see some correspondence between God and his godness and us in what we're doing. And... You remember, all of this, in a sense, can be thought of in a little bit like apophatic theology. You remember that term? We talked about that, didn't we? Apophatic versus cataphatic. Remember? You don't remember. You do remember. You should remember. Apophatic theology is another term for negative theology. The things we don't know about God. The things we can't say. So when you do... Um, Apophatic theology, you're actually doing theology by way of negation. Say all the things we, God isn't. Okay? Kataphasis is saying all the things that God is. So actually when we're talking about the attributes of God, the apophatic kind of comes here. These are all the things that God isn't. He's not complicated. He's not changeable. He's not measurable. He's not um, limited to places. 
So it's kind of an apophatic. Cataphatic is the things that we say positively. So the positive attributes are more the cataphatic a little bit. Okay. So that's close. But this even, but the, remember the apophatic and cataphatic is even wider than just the attributes. This is it's a whole way of doing theology. An apophatic way of doing theology is just to always be careful to say what we don't know and nothing more. All right, so now we go to the positive attributes. Let's click through these rather quickly. So the first one we talk about is that God is life. God is life. So he is, he is life itself. And again, the simplicity, it's not like he has life, but he is life. And all life comes from him, and all life is related to him. All creatures have a derived life, but God has life absolutely. But be careful here again. We're not going to slide into a sort of Eastern um, religion sort of, you know, God fills us all, and he's the divine spark, and he, you know, interconnects us all, circle of life, you know, Disney kind of stuff. Not that. All right. God's knowledge, the scientia dei. Remember, science is nothing more than the Latin word for knowledge. And so when we talk about God's prescience, we're talking about what he knows before the, the foreknowledge. Okay, so prescience is foreknowledge, and the scientia of God is just what God knows. All right, <clears throat> so we talk about God having omniscience, which seems like that would be something that is a negative attribute, but since we have knowledge, it's a positive attribute. So we have knowledge, just not as much as God does. And so that's why there's a difference here. So God's omniscience, he knows everything. Everything. Omniscience, God knows everything. And as Pieper says, he knows everything that has happened, he knows everything that will happen, and he knows every possible contingency. Well, maybe, but why does he even have to worry about the contingencies? He just knows everything that is. And there's nothing that he doesn't know. This is important because there are um, many um, efforts to try to do a theodicy that end up limiting this. In fact, this is one of the things that gets talked about on page 449, and Pieper mentions Socinus. Socinus was actually a Reformation era guy, and Socinus ended up getting executed for heresy because he denied the Trinity. So he was anti-Trinitarian, but he was also anti-omniscience. He taught that God was limited in his understanding. Footnote 84. No argument nor scripture testimony can be adduced from which it can clearly be gathered that even before they were committed, God knew the wicked deeds which came solely from the will of men. So what he's saying is that God doesn't know everything. He doesn't know things before they happen. Now what's interesting is there is in theology today a group of people who have actually their roots in evangelicalism and known as open Theology, or actually, actually, open theism is what the term they're using. Open theism. And what they mean, open theism teaches that God is bound by the passage of time just like we are. And that he doesn't know things until they actually happen. So he had to wait and see what Adam and Eve would do. And he's waiting to see what you will do at any moment. Now, obviously, who's going to really be in favor of this kind of thing? Anybody who's trying to um, salvage free will is going to really like open theism because now man gets free choice and God has to wait and see how things play out. So free will people are prone to open theism. But open theism is a flat out denial of omniscience because omniscience says God knows everything, even what's going to happen. And the way to think about this the best way, and this is always so hard because I mean, we're, we're bound by time. We as creatures are time bound. We can't imagine outside of time, even though books and movies and TV shows play with this a lot. It's fun to think about, but we really can't escape time. And even, you know, if you're Frank Herbert fans, Dune, you know, folding time and thinking about time travel, all this kind of stuff. It's, it's fun to think about, but we really can't imagine life apart from time. And yet that's what God operates. So for God, everything that exists in this creation is an eternal present right now all the time, eternally present. So Adam and Eve for God are happening now. And the second coming, the consummation for God is happening now. It's all now. He just looks and sees it all at once, which is bizarre. We can't even imagine. But that's how it is. God is outside of it all. You can kind of think about time all happening in, the, in a globe here, and it's just working its way around, and God's just standing out, watching it all, seeing it all, all at once. This is all actually very helpful because this idea of the omniscience of God and his relationship to time and his ability to know things helps us with things like the doctrine of the atonement. Because sometimes people will ask, now Jesus paid the price for our sin, right? And what was the, what's the wages of sin? Well, it's hell, separation from God forever. Well, how long was Jesus on the cross? Six hours. 
Well, that's not eternity. So how can Jesus, and it's horrible, okay, but just, you know, separation from God for a couple of hours, that's enough to pay for the sins of the whole world? And one of the ways to answer that, there are a couple things you can say, but one thing to bring up is, hey, time is different for God. And the reality is that Christ is an eternal sacrifice before the Father and that he is eternally the one who is the lamb given for us. And that doesn't change. And you even get hints of this in the scriptural record where um, Jesus appears to Thomas and what's he show him? The nail marks are still there. It's not because it was just a couple days ago and he hadn't quite healed yet. Remember, he's in his glorified body. He doesn't need a few more days to get all fixed up. This is his glorified body, but the mark's still there. He's always the sacrifice one. And in, in the book of Revelation, where the lamb appears as one having been slain. So the marks are always there. The stigmata are part of it. So this is helpful on this whole idea of the, the time factor is different for God than it is for us. And that sheds some light on some things. All right. Yes, Joel? Sorry, but so is he then still presently suffering that separation then? Um, yes and no. Don't go too far with it, but just live with it. I know, I know. And yet the reality is that the completed sacrifice, fully accepted by the Father, is a present enduring reality. Perfect tense. There you go, Greek guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you all love that. All right. Good. Um, people who try to tell the future, bad news, only God does that. And you've all been down this in your kind of catechism class. You don't go to fortune tellers, tarot cards you don't mess with, um, because you're basically encroaching on God's stuff. It's not our business, and so don't do that. Fortune cookies, probably okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you're so inaccurate. All right, yeah, that's good news, huh? All right, <clears throat> good. Now, we get into um, what God knows about everything, and he sees these things happening. This page 450 is where we make the distinction between God's foreknowledge and his foreordaining something. And as I've already stressed at the beginning of class today, this is an accurate theological distinction, but it really doesn't solve the um, existential, experienced problems that people have in life when bad things are happening. So know when to give the explanations and know when not to. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Good, good, good. Um, yeah. Page 451, where we have this idea of God kind of entering into time. Since there's no past or future of God, how can we speak of God's pres um, you know, foreknowledge? God ascribes prescience to himself, but he does so for our way of thinking. So in other words, he's coming into our world, into our situation. All right, good. Enough on that. Any other questions on the prescience of God or the omniscience of God? All right. Wisdom of God. Wisdom of God is simply the fact that what God is doing is exactly right. And now this is what's really cool on page 453 where we have to hold this tension then. So, because people are on one says, and says, well, God has foreknowledge, but it doesn't mean it's all happening according to the way he's for making it happen. It's not fated. And yet, page 453, bottom of the page, right before the page break, in spite of the modernist and the old Adam and the Christian, the scriptural truth cannot be challenged that not only in a general way, but in every detail, everything in this world is taking the right course. Wow, how can you say that unless you've got an absolutely transcendent God who's directing everything exactly according to his plan? So you see, you've got to hold these things together and you end up having to hold them kind of loosely and being able to say both things and be careful how much you say one side or the other side. Hold them both carefully. It cannot be otherwise, for all things are controlled by the expert hand of the all-wise God. God knows what he's doing. Now, Peter goes even further. This includes also all the punishments, famines, wars, depressions, earthquakes, floods, with which God allows mankind to be afflicted. Wow, God's punishing. He does that kind of stuff. That shocks a lot of Christians. They think God just does nice stuff in his rocking chair. These things must serve God's gracious purpose and will to bring men to repentance and faith as Christ expressly teaches on the basis of concrete examples. All right, good. Enough on that. Now to the will of God. So we have to be careful with this so seenness and open theism. That's a wrong thing. Now we go from omniscience to the will of God. And underneath the will of God, in other words, this is 
God's ability to choose and to do things. And here he's very different than us because our will is always limited by our human incapacity and our human limitations. God's will is not limited. But Peter is going to park all kinds of things underneath the will of God. All kinds of stuff underneath here. In fact, pretty much everything else, the rest of his attributes are going to be underneath the will of God. Now, before we get into this, we have to distinguish, and this gets to your question, some of you guys were wondering about at the outset, between the two main ones I want you to know are these. The antecedent will of God and the consequent will of God. The antecedent will of God and the consequent will of God. This distinction is really helpful when we think about salvation issues. The antecedent will of God is the will of God before man acts or resists or sins or rebels. The antecedent will of God is the will of God from the outset. The consequent will of God is the will of God that kicks in once man does something. So what we're up against here again, and we bump into this all the time, is this reality that you've got a God who is completely God, fully divine and fully supreme, and yet man who is held accountable and responsible and has the ability to resist God. That's why we reject the I in tulip Calvinism. Irresistible grace, wrong. Man can say no. Man can kick back. Man can fight against God. And so it's got to be both things. So antecedent will of God. God wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Does he? Yes. But then why do some people go to hell? Because if God wants something, doesn't he get what he wants? Well, you see, that's kind of funny because, well, yeah, he gets what he wants. But he also is giving people the ability to say no and to reject. And if somebody rejects, then his consequent will is, you want hell? You'll get it. And so you have the parable of the you know, man being thrown out into the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, is that God's will to punish him that way? Yeah, it was, or it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> so it was. But it's, that's the consequent will of God. So the consequent will of God is in relation to human sin. So in relation to human sin, to human action, there's this consequent will of God. Or human sin or just action in general. Because you could even talk about, I suppose, Nineveh this way. So the antecedent will of God is, I'm going to destroy them. And then the consequent will is, well, they repented. Okay, no, I won't. So I repent of doing evil. Yes, Dan. How does this fit in with the human remedy? Well, actually, that's where you have to be careful. And let scripture teach you and not have your a priori stuff. So God's immutability, remember, goes to his character. His character is consistent. He doesn't punish those who repent. That's cool. And he's just. And so he does punish those who are impenitent. So he's immutable. All right, don't think about it too much. Okay, good. Good. Now we go to the holiness of God. Um, Odin has a nice definition for holiness, which I think kind of captures this very well. Page 101. The holiness of God, we remember, has two aspects. And one aspect is the holy other, the differentiation between God and all things. We talk about holy things are things set apart, and that's fair enough. But there's also another part of holiness, which is just morally upright, ethically pure. That's part of holiness, and we shouldn't diminish that. Peter gets both of those parts on page 456. Now, in 101, Odin suggests this as an understanding of holy. I think this is on the right track. All God's actions are holy, for there is no inconsistency between God's being and God's activity. God acts so as to express God's character, which summarizes and unifies all other divine excellences. So in other words, the holiness of God means integrity, that God's being and God's actions are in sync. There's no disconnect. There's no out-of-stepness. There's, there's a complete continuity between who God is and what he does, and that's what makes holiness holiness. And I think that's pretty good. That's on the right track there. All right, the justice of God God's justice is he always does that which is right for each person. But be careful here. God is, people use this term, ex lex. Ex lex, not ex lax, big difference. Um, ex lex. Ex lex means outside the law. So lex just means law, and ex is outside, so ex lex is outside the law. So what that means is God gives the law. And he is supreme over the law, not the other way around. This is important because in some um, parts of evangelicalism, some strains of Calvinism, you will get this sense that somehow there is this supreme law to which God must follow. And then the law almost starts to sound as bigger, bigger than God. 
like there's, you know, rules that have to be followed. Even God has to do this. Well, no, God is ex lex. He is outside the law. He creates the law. The law comes from him. He's not bound to the law except only as the law is a part of his character. God is bound by his character in the sense that he will always do what is in sync with this character. And that's where we have one, that last omni, which is the idea of God's omnipotence, that God can do everything, well, yeah, he can do everything that is in sync with his character, with his holiness. And so his omnipotence is bound only by his own character, and that's why God can't do something that would deny his own character. And so that's why, while he's ex lax, we don't worry that, oh, he's going to be arbitrary. No, because he's not going to be violating his own character, even though he's not bound to the law in the way that we're bound to the law. He's outside of the law. So can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? And you say, well, that's just a stupid question. Don't ask. And probably not because he wouldn't bother. All right, God's truthful and then God's power. So now we have the power of God, which is part of the will of God because God does these things, and that's where we get the omnipotence of God. Um, God can do what he wants within his, within his um, ways of doing these things. Then, finally, we have God's mercy and love and grace and long-suffering and patience and all this kind of thrown in together. And he makes distinctions, mercy being you know, what God does for those who are totally outside of his, his will, but he still shows them mercy. And then we have the love of God and the long-suffering, the patience, and all these come into play here. And very nicely done. Um, and I guess it's almost to the end, 463. Second to last paragraph, very tail end. The same is done by the modern theologians who deny the satisfaction of vicaria, which you know by now is the vicarious satisfaction, Christ's death in our place. But only too often, even Christians who clearly understand the doctrine of God's grace and are also able to state it correctly deface God's gracious countenance. This occurs when they attempt to determine God's gracious attitude toward themselves on the basis of their subjective feelings and emotions and on the basis of the objective word of God. So we are limiting God's power when we're actually not taking him at his word. And this is interesting because the Zwinglians, we'll talk about this later um, in other courses, would like to say that God doesn't need any means. God's too powerful. He's not bound by means. And what people are saying is that when we try to look for God to work in areas outside of his promised means, we're actually limiting God's power because we're trying to say what you've promised isn't good enough. And we don't like that. We'd rather have you do it some other way. And we're not really taking God at his word. All right. That gets us through everything.